All right, good afternoon. Thank you for joining us for our panel today about World War I and American art. The exhibition, which is the most ambitious ever mounted about the response of American artists to the Great War, is time to coincide with the centennial of the United States entry into the conflict. It presents 140 works of art, organized roughly according to the chronological arc of the war and its aftermath. The works range in date from 1914 to 1945. In addition, there are four contemporary works of art that show how the war continues to linger. I hope you will take the opportunity to see the exhibition today if you have not already. The main topics of our discussion here will be war in the body, medicine, and remembrance. The panel follows closely on the heels of our national holiday honoring our country's war veterans, a time when these very issues are top of mind. November 11th, of course, is also Armistice Day, when the fighting of World War I finally came to an end in 1918. Our panelists, Lisa Boudreau of the Tennessee State Museum and Ken McLeish of Vanderbilt University, are researchers focused on war. The books that they have published are listed in the handout, and I highly recommend them. Both Lisa and Ken are brilliant thinkers and beautiful writers, and I am grateful to them for their willingness to share their unique insights that they bring to our exhibition. So our discussion today will be structured around works of art, most of which are on view in World War I and American art. But to set up our conversation, Ken would like to begin with a quote from the German philosopher Walter Benjamin about the trauma caused by the unprecedented destruction of World War I. Uh, thanks, Trinita, and thank you for that, uh, that very uh, generous introduction as well. And uh, thanks also to the Frist and to all of you uh, for, uh, for being here today. I've really been looking forward to this conversation. I wanted to kick things off today with this uh, quotation from Walter Benjamin, who was a, uh, a German Jewish uh, philosopher and critic um, who, uh, uh, who wrote, uh, did most of his writing in the, the period between World War I and uh, World War II. And so he was someone who had lived through the destruction of the First World War and was also, uh, at the, the time that he did a lot of his work, dismayed by the rise of fascism in 1930s Germany. Um, and uh, he wrote in this uh, this essay called uh, "The Storyteller" that he um, that he, he uh, that he wrote during that time, um, kind of reflecting on the devastation of war and what it meant for what had seemed like modern progress to produce this tremendous amount of destruction. Um, uh, he wrote what I thought was a, a fitting uh, kind of meditation for us to kick off this discussion. Uh, so, as it says here on the slide. Um, was it not noticeable at the end of the war that men returned from the battlefield grown silent, not richer, but poorer in communicable experience? For never has experience been contradicted more thoroughly than strategic experience by tactical warfare, economic experience by inflation, bodily experience by mechanical warfare, moral experience by those in power. A generation that had gone to school on a horse-drawn streetcar now stood under the open sky, in a countryside in which nothing remained unchanged but the clouds. And beneath these clouds, in a field of force of destructive torrents and explosions, was the tiny, fragile human body. And I paired this quote with this photograph of uh, the Battle of the Somme. And these are, uh, I believe, British soldiers uh, in, a, uh, in a trench in the midst of the Battle of the Somme, which was uh, the scene of uh, well, one of one of many deadly scenes of, uh, or uh, one of, excuse me, one of many scenes of deadly and protracted trench warfare fighting. Uh, I, I paired it with this particular image because it's such a vivid illustration of these conditions of war making that Benjamin is talking about, um, and a good opportunity, I think, for us to think about the relationship between how war fighting technology uh, directly impacted people's bodily experience of what it meant to be at war. And we can see in this photograph a number of the things that he is talking about. So these are, this is French farmland that has been reduced by high explosive artillery fire uh, to what essentially just looks like a moonscape. There's uh, very little recognizable about it as a natural landscape, and there's this sense that I hopefully we'll have a chance to come back to through, through some of the other artworks of the natural world just being 
the natural world itself being utterly devastated uh, by war making technology and human beings, uh, in this case, these, uh, these British soldiers, um, literally sort of living like burrowing creatures uh, in, um, in these, these holes in the earth in their protective trenches. Often in the background, there's this um, kind of dilapidated shape that is a, uh, a tank that has been disabled either by, by being blown up or driving into a trench or a tank trap. Uh, and World War I was also the advent of tank warfare. Um, and, and we can see with this, this object in the background sort of a reminder of both the, the kind of terrible promise of technology, uh, but also its, uh, its frailty and potential failings. Um, and yeah, and so all of that is just to sort of situate, uh, situate these experiences of the body and technology and then war-related injury and experience at this moment of epochal change where what seemed like progress uh, was also uh, incredibly uh, barbaric and brutal to human life, um, where progress itself might be something that, would want, that we would want to call into question. Uh, the idea, as Benjamin says, that this is something that is political uh, because it represents a betrayal or exploitation of the folks whose, whose lives and bodies are actually on the line being affected. Uh, it, it represents potentially a betrayal of those folks or, uh, or an objectification of those folks by the people in power who are making decisions about how to wage war and, how to, and, and when to fight and when to end the fighting. Um, and that, uh, that in the midst of this, it's the human body so the, that, that remains consistent or that is sort of the one thing that we have to hang on to as a point of reference, uh, both as the thing that is doing the fighting, the thing that's getting hurt and being injured, and then the thing that is also the target of healing and the target of remembrance, as I think we're gonna have the opportunity to talk about as we, uh, as we, as we go ahead. All right, so, um this is one of the earliest works in the exhibition. It dates from 1914, and it's a political cartoon by um, an artist named John Sloan, who is probably more famous today for his paintings. And uh, he made this cartoon for um, a, a leftist magazine based in uh, Greenwich Village, and it's called After the War, A Medal and Maybe a Job. And uh, John Sloan was a, a pacifist and a socialist, and he was very much against the United States entering the war. Um, and uh, I, think, I think it's um, quite important that already in 1914, we have artists who recognize that, um, that uh, soldiers uh, will have to sacrifice quite a lot um, if the US uh, enters the war. Yeah, and uh, I, so Elisa and I were uh, chatting as we were getting started, and uh, uh, and she said, "Oh yeah, that Sloan cartoon is really gruesome." Which I and I had not thought about the fact that we would be looking at this while uh, while we we're eating lunch, and so I <laughs> apologize for the fact that this is this is my choice uh, uh, that we that we include this particular image. Um, but I wanted to include it uh, uh, for exactly the reason that Trinita just uh, just mentioned um, that. Uh, you know, one, it's a, I think it's a very vivid sign uh, and reminder to us that whether we're talking about World War I, whether we're talking about contemporary conflicts, um, that the, uh, uh, the, the body of the injured soldier is this profoundly political symbol that plays into discussions about um, how and when to go to war. And one of the things that this actually reminded me of was sort of a, um, something else that was going on at the at the time in the early uh, in the early 1900s and in the sort of the lead up to the U.S.'s entry into the First World War, which was a tremendous anxiety about what to do with the uh, the injured or disabled soldier in general. So not only was there this sort of um, caution or skepticism about uh, who exactly was going to pay the price for going for going into war, there was also a lot of uh, sort of much more widespread anxiety about how will our society function if we send off vast numbers of people to fight and they come back uh, to be uh, potential burdens to the state or they come back unable to perform uh, the kinds of labor or the kinds of um, you know, gendered expectations that we expect of our, you know, our young, uh, young men to be heads of household and breadwinners and fathers and things like that. Um, and, uh, and in fact, medicine played an important, a very important role even at this stage because the idea that uh, uh, advances in surgical techniques and rehabilitative medicine that were that became really honed over the course of the war, but that had begun to be pioneered as the U.S. was contemplating its entry into the war, 
these things, these medical advances uh, based on healing bodies made the idea of entering war and exposing American soldiers to violence more palatable because it suggested that the human cost of waging war could be reduced. And, uh, and I think, so I appreciate this image as kind of a caution against that, the idea that these uh, decisions are still, you know, still potentially exploitative, still involve uh, decisions about asking others to place their, uh, their lives on the line. Um, but that also uh, medicine uh, is something that is directly implicated in the way that we talk explicitly or implicitly about the costs of war and what it means to go to war because it informs our sense of what it means for folks to be injured in war and what the, what the stakes of that are. So the United States enters the war in April of 1917. And once it does so, um, uh, the government starts issuing a lot of posters um, in order to raise an army. So um, you'll see in the exhibition quite a few enlistment posters um, encouraging uh, young men, um, initially between the ages of 21 and 31, uh, to enlist. And uh, this this is actually one of my favorite of these posters. This is uh, by a female designer named Laura Bray, and it reads, enlist, on which side of the window are you? And this is from uh, the first year of the war. Uh, do you wanna talk about it or? Yes. Hello everyone, and thank you for coming. It's, uh, reiterate your comments, Ken. It's really a pleasure and an honor to be here today, and I hope we, I can contribute something worthwhile to your uh, afternoon, to your interest in this, in this topic. I love this poster as well. I think this is wonderful. Um, very quickly, to reiterate what uh, has already been said, April 6, 1917, Woodrow Wilson goes to Congress and he asks for a de declaration of war against Germany. And of course, he receives this and uh, within just a few weeks, by May or June, the Selective Service Act became a reality, and we needed troops to, uh, to uh, add the numbers to the military to send them overseas. And so this Laura Bray uh, poster, I think, does an excellent job at that. It's a very clever use of light and dark. Um, it asks the question, it, it tries to elicit an emotional response from this man, uh, standing there in his suit, there's, there's almost a class dynamic going on. He's looking on the other side. He's in the dark. He's in the shadow. And he's looking out into the light where he sees uh, very strong, uh, virile men, courageous men. They're, of course, in the lighter side of the window. And he's sort of ambivalent, you know, should I go, should I not go? And uh, I think she speaks to this, and she's... Um, trying to instill pride in those who are maybe thinking, well, it's not really for me. I don't know if I should do this or not. So um, she makes great use of shadows, I think, and uh, putting him in the, in sort of in the dark. And then once he decides to enlist, of course, he'll be sort of in the light, so to speak. So it's an excellent way to galvanize public support and to mobilize men for the military. Um, and, and of course, it also uh, uh, it, it also is an image that really relies on our culturally ingrained notions of masculinity as something that is associated with war, right? Um, so this is a uh, that that in in kind of doing all these uh, these these compelling aesthetic maneuvers that uh, that you just described, Lisa, like there um, there is very much a sort of appeal to manhood, the idea that. Uh, that that serving in the military is going is something that uh, that constitutes you as a man in a culturally recognizable and socially appropriate way, and by implication suggesting that uh, uh, that not taking up uh, service, that staying on this side of the window, um, uh, uh, does not uh, does not represent the sort of fulfillment of uh, of the promise of manhood and. Uh, this idea of the kind of the, the gendered character of military service, which we're, I know some of the other images are going to speak to uh, as well, this is also something that very much persists in the present. Even though we think of our, uh, you know, we probably think of ourselves a hundred years later having um, having much more uh, uh, 
sort of progressive views of uh, both gender inclusivity in military settings and in society as a whole, um, but the kind of appeal to manhood and the idea that um, that there are certain, there's a certain kind of masculinity that in American society you can only get access to through military participation is something that, uh, that, uh, that we continue to see uh, being exercised and that, uh, at least from my perspective as an anthropologist, alerts us to something important about how it is that we think about war and how it is that we think about uh, uh, gender in our society, uh, sort of who's allowed to have access to this special sort of prestige and um, and how it is that, that these ideas about gender are mobilized for, uh, uh, for the purposes of, of war making. So in the uh, enlistment poster, we were looking at a, a, a man and um, his involvement in war. Um, in a very kind of pensive moment. Um, here is one where we see the war um, from a mother's point of view. Um, this is a painting by uh, Gifford Beale, which shows um, the town of Newburgh on Hudson, which is about 60 miles north of New York City. It's actually quite near to West Point. Um, and so that's the, the Hudson River there in the background. And we see a, a small town essentially being uh, evacuated um, of its men as they march off to both um, uh, the train and the boat um, by the waterfront. Um, I know that uh, this painting was of uh, particular interest to Lisa, who has thought a lot about um, kind of the sacrifice of mothers and... Um, also, I think this one immediately called to mind the World War I song, uh, I didn't raise my son to be a soldier, right? Actually, you did. I don't know if you know that, but uh, mothers then didn't know that, but they quickly realized that. They certainly did raise their boy to be a soldier. Um, I really like this one. I, I, I think that uh, Beale gives this sentimental uh, sense to um, this, it's not just another patriotic parade. Um, she has a, the, there is a great use of, of uh, he has he's great use of light here. Um, I didn't realize that his parents had a summer home here and that was why he chose uh, Newburgh. Um, great town actually. Um, but yes, the, once again you see this shadowy side where the, where the mother's being left behind with, with the child and this great use of light leaving her behind. And once again, you see uh, the soldiers, the strong, the, the uh, heroic, going off on their adventure in the light, of course. And we know that they're about to, to leave because we see the smoke of the train in the center of the, of the scene here. Um, women, um, uh, um, <laughs> I just want to say this. Um, the, the separation, I think, of, of women being left behind is an important one for this period because uh, women as mothers and as wives, particularly as mothers, have to uh, give their uh, boy up and it's part of being considered being uh, a citizen in the United States. That's a role that mothers quickly realized that that was going to be one of their key uh, responsibilities in a democratic nation is that you're going to be asked to raise and then give up your son to the United States and, and in a democracy this is what's expected and uh, it becomes a very important part of the history of the story of World War I. There's a term called Republican motherism, motherhood and at this time you have to remember that uh, motherhood and apple pie. Uh, motherhood was, mothers were at the uh, pinnacle of, of uh, uh, this was the high water mark for motherhood during this period and into the 20s. And uh, they certainly played this up years later after, in 1917, the uh, Gold Star Mother Movement got started and throughout the whole 1920s, mothers lobbied for, uh, to go overseas and they became a very strong political force in this country. But at this period, there's still some innocence here being shown as they watch the men go off. And I, th I just think it's a very poignant scene and uh, uh, I just love his use of color and light here. Thanks. 
I'm kind of continuing uh, to think about the role of women in World War I. We have um, several posters um, that uh, address women. Um, these were both uh, produced by the YWCA, and on the left we have uh, women going to work in uh, an armaments factory. And then on the right we have uh, a, a telephone operator working on the front. You can see the soldiers behind. So there were about 300 American women who uh, worked in uh, France. They were bilingual women who um, worked uh, to serve um, the army as telephone operators. And um, it's a, a really fascinating story, actually. The, um, the women uh, were required to wear army uniforms, as we actually see uh, here. But after the war, they weren't considered uh, official members of the army. And it was only in 1978, uh, 60 years after the end of the war, um, that they received uh, veterans' benefits. So Lisa, I know that you've done some uh, research on the role of the YWCA during World War I. I think what the, this is a great pair of posters right here. I think what they scream is if we're going to uh, make it through this war, we're going to need uh, women. We're going to need them working outside the home, and we're going to need them uh, on the home front and overseas to support men in a whole new way. So roughly 30,000 women uh, eventually volunteered to be clerks and telephone operators and uh, nurses. And uh, I think that this, artistically speaking, I think uh, Baker and, and Underwood's interpretation there is really uh, a good, com good contrast because on the, on the left side, um, you, if you look at the women that are shown here, they sort of have a really tough look to them. They're sort of a socialist, kind of Stalinist. I'm getting out of my field here. I should stick to history. But, um, um, you know, it's a, it's a really tough woman, a tough kind of a woman, and she's wearing this really tough military uniform. And then on the right, you see a softer, more feminine female, and she's kind of sitting back in her nice little outfit, and she's got a um, little dress on, and, uh, you know, she just looks softer and more feminine. So in a way, they're kind of appealing to uh, a variety of women, saying, you know, we've got something for everybody here, you know, so hey, come and join us, we need you. And I think women were, uh, this, it was the moment. They were ready to step out to, uh, it was a sort of an exploitation, I think. But then again, you know, this wartime, everybody's being exploited. So, <laughs> um, yeah, I think it's, these are great posters, yeah. Yeah, and just to just to sort of tag on to that that comment about exploitation. I mean, I think one of the one of the ways that we can think about what we're seeing here between this image and the um, uh, uh, the, the painting just the uh, the Baker painting and then or excuse me the the Gifford Beale painting uh, and then the Enlist poster is also just the way that. Uh, you know, that, that our ideas about what kinds of work of war making is appropriate, are appropriate to whom, uh, our ideas about gender are reproduced within war, but they're also, also maybe sort of, yeah, exploited or instrumentalized. So the, um, as, as the military would go on to do in subsequent conflicts, sort of appealing to the broader, um, the, the broader desire of American women to, uh, to, be, um, to be increasingly independent or to enter the workforce in domains that have been closed to them. Um, that there's this interesting tension between sort of new opportunities and uh, and and yeah yeah and yeah and the the sort of endurance of these stereotypes. So I'm very grateful to Lisa for um, bringing these photographs to our attention, um, and they are related to Vanderbilt University's. Um, involvement in World War One, and this is something I think that you've been researching for the Tennessee State Museum. Yes, I, I have to pitch a plug here <laughs> for the Tennessee State Museum. This is the point where I do that. So, um, but seriously, we are very excited to be building a brand new uh, museum over on Jefferson Street, and uh, one of the exhibitions that we're going to be opening with, since it will be next year in 2018, uh, is a Centennial World War One exhibit. 
And uh, in addition to our regular gallery, which will showcase World War I, World War II, Civil Wars, other wars, we're going to have a special dedicated room just for the centennial of World War I. And I was so excited when I arrived here three years ago in Nashville to explore the collections and to discover that we really do have a wonderful collection of World War I artifacts. And so just for today, I thought it would be appropriate to showcase two of the key uh, features of the exhibit. And on your left is Dr. Albert uh, Wynn Harris, Jr. And he married, some of you may know, Con Overton Thompson of Glen Levin. And uh, he uh, went to France with Unit S of the Vanderbilt Medical Unit. And uh, we have his collection in the museum. We have his trunk and all his uh, surgical instruments and his uniform. And it, it's, it's just very exciting that to, when I discovered him, I was so pleased. So here on the right is actually the uh, um, Army Nurse Corps, the uh, hospital unit that went over to France from Vanderbilt. Vanderbilt was extremely instrumental key in this area as far as supporting the war effort. They had an ambulance unit, ambulance unit sorry, uh, that they sponsored uh, and also uh, the whole hospital unit. Because when, uh, war, when the United States first entered the war, we did not have sufficient uh, medical services, hospitals ready to go. So we relied on the Red Cross uh, and extremely relied on the Red Cross to help us get through those initial first months. So as you recall, the British are already fighting over there and they've got their hospital units, but they need to be freed up so that they can do more. So the United States sent over uh, six uh, base hospital units and Vanderbilt followed along very closely on that uh, over to France to free up the British hospitals. And so I think we can be very proud of the fact. And also Gertrude uh, Whitney Vanderbilt, I believe, Vanderbilt, Vanderbilt Whitney. Okay. I remember reading about her driving through the uh, front lines in a, in a, I was going to say in a Jeep, but that would not be right. <laughs> Um, right, in a Model 8 Ford, that's probably what, it, or maybe a Packard. Um, but yes, uh, the Vanderbilt family was uh, very key in this war, and we're so proud to, to have this part of the exhibit to show. So thank you. Oh, can I just add one more thing, too? Um, when we started out, the Army Nurse Corps had only 400 nurses, and by the end of the war, we had 21,000 nurses geared up and ready to go. So um, I had jotted down a little um, uh, thought here, and perhaps Ken will elaborate on that throughout the, the program. Uh, lessons learned on prior wars had to be relearned, and I think this is um, key, uh, one of the key things, to be prepared. And so at that point on, we, we made sure that uh, we had the nurse, the medical uh, units ready to go. And we learned an awful lot from the First World War in terms of medical care. So, thanks. All right. So, one of the great discoveries of the exhibition is a large group of watercolors um, now held by the Smithsonian um, by the artist Claggett Wilson. And you'll see, I think, 14 watercolors in the exhibition and all by him. And um, uh, 12 of them deal with uh, the time that the artist spent um, in the Battle of Belo Wood, which was one of the largest um, battles of the war. It lasted almost an entire month in June of 1918. And, uh, Claggett Wilson really uh, makes an effort to teach those of us who weren't there what it was like to experience it. And um, this is uh, uh, an incredibly um, kind of shocking image of um, a runner. Um, so this is a man who was charged with um, carrying messages from one end of the battlefield to the other. And um, it was an extremely dangerous uh, job, and you can see uh, that right here in the watercolor. I know that this is one that interested you a lot. Yes. Ken. Yeah. So um, 
Uh, I'm, I'm now, uh, I'm racking up the gory pictures, I guess. <laughs> and so again, my apologies. Uh, this is, um, I, I, just, I just find this, this picture and the other, uh, we're gonna look at a couple other Claggett Wilson uh, paintings too, just so, so compelling. And one of the things that really uh, grabs me about them uh, are the titles, which uh, if anyone has been to the, um, has been to the exhibit, uh, you may have taken note of this. So the full title of this, uh, of this painting is Runner Through the, excuse me, Runner Through the Barrage, Bois de Bello, Chateau Theory Sector, His Arm Shot Away, His Mind Gone. And they, they really, I mean, they almost have the, the sound of sort of like modernist poetry or, uh, or something like that. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and it's something that is, that's echoed in, well, again, I, I should say, I'm an anthropologist, I'm not an historian or, uh, 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 or a, um, uh, uh, a, a curator or an expert in art, um, but it's really one of the things that, that leaps out at me about this image is the sort of the modernist quality of the, um, the image, the almost sort of like cubist uh, quality of how the, um, the, the, the runner's face is depicted. Uh, but then, like softened by the watercolors and these, uh, this sort of interesting um, melding of I don't know, like a face that looks almost skeletal or robotic, um, and uh, and then this uh, a very sort of sketchy and impressionistic um, natural environment that this figure is moving through. And this is one of the this is one of the images in this exhibit that made me think of that Walter Benjamin quote of, uh, of, of a hu the human body moving through a dramatically altered um, natural landscape. And here we see that, uh, uh, um, that sense of juxtaposition and change also uh, kind of registered both in the body of the runner himself and his, uh, his missing arm, his arm that's been, um, that's been, been shot away by uh, enemy gunfire, but also in uh, in the landscape, so um, all these fallen trees all around him, and we can see the kind of split ends of uh, of the, the broken tree trunks and limbs, um, which ironically resemble the uh, the hands or the the hand that the runner is now missing, um, and so we can see sort of this kind of. Um, miming of, of damage to the human form and the natural world uh, being reflected back at one, at one another and understand this, uh, this natural order as something that is both being disrupted and perhaps also constitutes its, its own uh, set of, of harms. Like there, so it's, uh, to, you know, we might, perhaps it also looks as though those, uh, those splintered ends of the, the tree trunks are, uh, are sort of grasping um, at, this, at this runner as he makes his way um, through, uh, uh, through this dangerous terrain. Um, and so the sense of kind of what's natural, what kind of order of the world can be relied upon uh, has been, has literally been uh, shot to pieces. Um, and then finally, I, I just as uh, to, to um, foreshadow something that I'm sure we're gonna talk about uh, more in a little bit, uh, uh, the, the latter part of the title, his arm shot away, his mind gone. And, uh, and this too is an echo of um, that, that quote from Benjamin and this idea of uh, of um, you know the, this uh, uh, the kind of so he's he's carrying a message, uh, but the expression on his face suggests to us that he has seen or experienced things that he will not be able to communicate. Um, but also, uh, ironically or poignantly or powerfully, uh, we do get to experience some semblance of that because of these kind of dramatic and adventurous aesthetic decisions that Wilson makes in, uh, in this painting. And, and um, I'll have more to say about this in a couple of the other ones too, but the way that the, the painting sort of confronts us with the sense of physical injury and psychological trauma is something that is really hard to relate to or communicate, but then does it by showing those things to us and inviting us to think about them and inviting us to imagine the, um, the challenges faced by, uh, by those uh, afflicted on them, but also kind of drawing us in and, and, uh, and allowing, us, uh, allowing us to imagine. Right. Another American artist who saw the war firsthand was George M. Harding, and he was an official uh, war artist for the American government. So he was part of a group of eight artists known as the AEF-8. And here we see uh, a drawing um, called Cleaning Out Bosch Machine Gun Nest. So um, Bosch is a slang term for uh, German. and. Um, here we see uh, this extremely uh, frightening uh, tank um, up above uh, a trench. And um, the 
tank, as, as Ken mentioned earlier, um, is one of the new weapons of war um, that was invented by the um, French and the British. And here we see it being used uh, against the Germans. Do you want to talk a little bit more about it? Yeah. Yeah. We have a place to um, To me, when I looked at this, uh, first of all, it's just so scary, just isn't it so strikingly? Frightening, especially when you look at the the soldiers down in the the German soldiers down in the foxhole and the tank above their heads, and um, I think what this speaks to me is is of the new machinery of war, and this this mechanization being used either for good or for evil, in the sense that uh, motorized ambulances, for example, uh, were key to survival and recovery for on the beneficial side, but on the alternative, we see the evil that the machinery of war, this menacing uh, look of the, of the troops uh, on, um, and their very survival. And um, it, it's just, uh, notice too, <laughs> this is a really minor point, but notice too on their helmets, the camouflage, the dazzle camouflage. Um, this was used quite a bit, uh, not only for their helmets, but also for ships and for tanks and guns. And uh, it's an interesting detail, uh, I think, on this as well. But I'm not sure how to interpret that artistically, but uh, please go ahead. Yeah. Um, no, and I, the, I was also really struck by this image uh, for the same reason, the way that it offers uh, this kind of, this really like vivid, dynamic, um, depiction like the you know the elements in this uh, this picture really look like they're in motion uh, uh, of of these two uh, these two key um, new instruments of war the tank and the machine gun which was also uh, you know had been used in a couple of uh, earlier conflicts uh, uh, particularly uh, colonial conflicts uh, but World War One was its first um, its first uh, uh, really significant mass use and places uh, the first place where it was used by both sides of a um, uh, uh, of a of a conflict on a large scale, um, and so we see, uh, and not to not to put too fine a point on it, but we see these two new technologies, the two, these two sort of marvels of uh, of modern innovation turned against one another, um, as they were turned against one another throughout the entire war, um, along with a couple uh, uh, a, a few other. So there's barbed wire that was also also a, a relatively new innovation that was a really important uh, technical detail of uh, the World War One landscape. Um, and, uh, uh, oh, but then one, so just a, an additional point about this that again is sort of there in the title, um, cleaning out a Bosch machine gun nest. So uh, like, like Trinita mentioned, uh, like Bosch was a, a slang term that reminds us of the dehumanization of the enemy that is, um, that is a, in many ways a kind of endemic feature of war. Again, even in modern and, and ostensibly enlightened wars or wars that are fought for more humane uh, purposes, dehumanization of the, the enemy, both through this term and the idea, essentially the, the implication of the enemy as, uh, as vermin or pests, right? Something to be cleaned out or disposed of, um, which suggests a kind of sense of alienation from, uh, from, from the enemy's humanity uh, uh, that, that is, uh, that's given material force through these, um, these new war-making tools. But something that also really strikes me about this that you also mentioned, Lisa, is the fact that, and it's especially, I mean, the, so the, this actual image is pretty small, right? It's like eight by 10, it's, it's quite small. But sitting down here at the bottom of it, the sense of menace that it creates is, is just even more heightened than what you get from looking at the original image itself. But even there in the smaller image, one of the things that really grabbed me was, okay, so, um, you know, so Harding is there with, uh, he's on the battlefield with American troops. And it really made me wonder what compelled him to represent this scene in this way. Because a huge part of what we see in the scene is the, uh, is the terror of the German troops. Um, the fact that they are, they're being utterly loomed over and overwhelmed and dominated by American force. And perhaps this is just a sort of exciting or propagandistic image. It's an image about crushing or annihilating the enemy. Um, but we might, also, we might also think about it as uh, potentially a sort of sympathetic or identifying image. The idea that this horrific landscape of war making was something that, uh, that despite there being two different sides, everyone was kind of all in it. Uh, together and uh, and and maybe arguably equally dehumanized by uh, by these sort of these tools and and techniques of making war that had been let loose. 
Um, or it might also just be a reminder that when we produce an image of war violence, um, the, uh, a lot is determined by the caption that you attach to it. That, you know, we, that maybe we don't know whether this is an anti-war image or a pro-war image, uh, whether this is a pro-US image or a pro-German image uh, uh, without, without the caption, or that freed of that caption, it, can, uh, it could come to sort of serve a, a lot of different purposes, uh, which I think is also, um, also maybe a, a useful thing to think about. So throughout the exhibition, we find over and over again that artists are telling us about the new weapons of war. And um, uh, one of the novelties of World War I is the extensive use of chemical warfare. And uh, this here is the painting that we open the exhibition with. It's John Singer Sargent's Gast. And um, this is a scene that uh, the painter himself witnessed. Um, it's the aftermath of a mustard gas attack. Um, these are British soldiers who um, are uh, victims of, uh, of a German attack. And um, here they are receiving uh, treatment, um, again, in a, in a field in France. Um, Lisa, I know that this is a, a painting of particular interest to you. Thanks, Janita. Um, yeah, I don't know. How many of you were here for the uh, talk that we had on Sargent uh, by, I'm Richard sorry, Ormond. by Richard Armand uh, on gas? Did anybody? Okay. Um, well, you missed a really, really good uh, presentation um, because to me, I, I uh, years ago, I remember seeing this painting at the Imperial War Museum and I always wondered, well, you know, uh, what is it about? I've seen photographs of the very same thing, but this, this painting to me is just so striking and you want to be sure to see it here in the exhibit. We're very fortunate to have it here. Um, I think in addition to the obvious ghastliness of ghast, um, it's the history behind this painting that was of interest to me. Um, and I don't want to be stepping on your ground here, Trinita, on this. I mean, you're the art historian, but the fact that it was so large, I always wonder, you know, well, why did he choose this topic? And in actual fact, John Singer Sargent uh, really uh, had no knowledge of war. He knew nothing about the Army, and, but he did have a, uh, I call him his sidekick, and uh, that was Henry Tonks. And Henry and uh, John Singer Sargent uh, went to the front line in uh, the summer of 1918. And uh, Sargent had been asked to, uh, to find subjects to, uh, to paint the Anglo-American effort. The Yanks had just, or the Doughboys, pardon me, had just arrived uh, at that time. Uh, and they were really coming into their height in the summer of 1918. So uh, Sargent was commissioned to uh, try and find uh, subjects uh, to show the uh, British and the Americans working together. Well, when he and Tonks got out to the front line, they uh, couldn't find this. They, couldn't, they could see one off here and there, but they couldn't actually see large groups. And Sargent wanted a subject that was in a large, large group. And so they just kind of literally stumbled into this field dressing station and I think for the first time, he really fully uh, understood what was going on here. The, the wholeness, the horrific uh, ghastliness of what this war was about. And he really captured it with this. I thought that, that there was an apocryphal story uh, when Tonks uh, and Sergeant were out in the field right before they came upon these men. And the, there was a guardsman there, and he was a British guardsman, and he pulled his gun as he saw Sergeant sketching his photograph, sketching the, the scene. And the guardsman said, halt, who goes there? And Sergeant was so oblivious to you know, what was going on around him, and he said, said his name, he said, it's Sergeant. And the guardsman said, the hell you say, I know the Sergeant and he ain't you. <laughs> So, and as it turned out, this painting actually was meant to be in what would be the new Hall of Remembrance. I believe it was in London. But things didn't work out that way, and so 
the uh, Imperial War Museum in London became what would be the, the remembrance site, and therefore the painting ended up at the Imperial War Museum. So I hope I did justice to that. And actually, let me just say that if anyone is interested in Richard Ormond's lecture, it is on our website. So he is um, the great nephew of the artist, and he has a lot of uh, personal insights into uh, Sargent's career. All right. Um, here we have another, um, I think this is a really beautiful uh, watercolor, again by Claggett Wilson. Um, the title here is Underground Dressing Station. The flesh is the thing crucified, pale in the dirt and darkness. And um, uh, this shows, uh, as the title indicates, an underground dressing station um, where the artist himself um, was treated. Um, so he was injured in the Battle of Bellow Wood. He was both uh, wounded and gassed. And uh, this is... Um, uh, just, um, you see the, the body of, uh, of a soldier, um, his, the, the artist has cropped the heads um, of a, a few of the figures here, um, only leaving the, um, the head of the, um, the doctor who is, um, who is treating the patient. Um, but you can see that the, uh, the, the injured um, soldier is uh, represented as a crucified body. Um, Ken, I think this is one you wanted to speak sure. to. Yeah. Yes. Um, so let's see. Yeah. So again, this incredibly haunting title that uh, you know that directs our attention directly to the um, that this kind of sacrificial imagery and the uh, uh, the idea of the the injured soldier as a uh, as a, a body being sacrificed. Though ironically, uh, you know, it's a, it's also an anonymous body. It's a body with no head, no face. It's um, you know, it's uh, literally sort of unknowable. Um, and, uh, and kind of, in some ways, reduced to the status of, uh, of, of an object. Um, and so there we see this sense of sacrifice as something that is both made really graphically clear, uh, but that is also profoundly depersonalized. And I don't, um, uh, again, it's not necessarily, actually, no, it, I'll say it is my business as an anthropologist to read too deeply into everything. Uh, and uh, and I, would, I would suggest that, uh, that, there's, uh, that there's maybe some pretty significant ambivalence uh, about the nature of, uh, of, of war-related injury and sacrifice that is, um, that's, uh, that's evoked by this image. Um, and uh, uh, including in the sense that um, you know that with this this invocation or evocation of, uh, of of crucifixion, there's also this sense of medicine as both um, uh, a form of, of ministration or aid, uh, but also as uh, as it's, as itself its own uh, its own source of pain or continuing injury uh, or punishment. So um, the idea that uh, that being kept alive in the midst of these circumstances uh, might not actually have felt particularly good at that moment, or might have been uh, a sort of furthering of the sacrifice that was begun, uh, begun with injury on the battlefield. Okay. Um, it almost honors the caregiver, doesn't it, really? Um, there's so much not emphasis, not just on the body here, but on those that are giving the care. And I wonder if his experience, perhaps in Bella Wood, may have contributed to his need to, to, to recognize those caregivers. But this, if it hasn't become clear already, I'm sure you, you will realize this, but it, this is a highly mechanized war, and it led to unprecedented uh, injuries, particularly to the uh, head uh, and the chest. And uh, I think that, I mean, it's just the terrible impact on the body here. But I, I asked, I sent this photograph to Trinita and asked her if she could pair it with this because of the uh, recurrent um, crucifix theme, which uh, the sacrificial lamb, this uh, Christ-like um, motif goes th or theme goes through um, all of, of First, the First World War. But there's also this, this procession I thought was important, the procession of the wounded, the procession from the battlefield. First of all, you start out with the parades, you proceed to war, and then you get to war, and then you proceed to the battlefield. From the battlefield, you're processing pro, pro, uh, a cross 
no man's land into battle. And then beyond that, you're either progressing, if, uh, if you're lucky, you get carried off the battlefield, you're progressing to hospital to care, or you're, the process is on to uh, a grave and the funeral procession. So, I mean, there's some interesting parallels here. But most striking, though, I think, is just the vulnerability of man in the face of this uh, mechanized warfare. All right, so we have about five minutes left and we have a lot more slides, so we need to kind of uh, decide here um, uh, what we want to do uh, with the remainder of the time. Um, should we pick one or two more? Yeah, I was, was going to say, should we skip ahead to Horace Pippin? Um, okay, Horace have, Pippin that, it is. Okay, okay, yeah, let's go forward. All right, so um, the exhibition features four works by Horace Pippin. There are three uh, oil paintings and then uh, a memoir that's presented on an iPad so that you can flip through it. It's a digital file. Um, but Horace Pippin was a, an African-American uh, artist and soldier. He fought during World War I as part of the Harlem Hellfighters, which was the 369th Regiment. And um, I can have uh, Ken and Lisa talk about this more, but African-American soldiers were segregated from uh, their white counterparts. And um, we see, I think very poignantly on the right, uh, a segregated barrack. Um, and then uh, on the left, we see kind of how valiant uh, these African-American soldiers were and how key they were to defeating the Germans. So um, this is a, a painting called uh, Starting Home, the Ending of the War. And um, you see Germans uh, surrendering to these African-American soldiers. Do you want to go first, Lisa? Um, no, that's okay. okay. So, uh, uh, there's there's so many things that are fascinating about uh, about Horace Pippin as a figure and uh, about this particular set of images, and so I'll, I'll try to confine myself to just a couple of them. One is um, uh, is just to observe that as with the the images of uh, women being recruited into or depicted in relationship to the war effort, um, these images are a reminder that war was waged in the midst of a profoundly unequal society in which some bodies and injuries to some bodies mattered more than others. And, uh, uh, and that the, the hurting and the healing of those bodies um, took place in a, uh, uh, in a profoundly unequal country. Um, and and it's, I think Pippin died in 1946, right? is that right? Um, and, uh, and so at the time that he died, he still lived in a segregated country. Uh, and the US, the US didn't just fight World War I with a segregated army, they fought World War II with a segregated army. And veterans of uh, not only, uh, African American veterans, not only of World War I, uh, but also of World War II, were systematically excluded from many of the, uh, the benefits that were extended to white veterans and that helped um, that, are, that are, are conventionally understood as helping to sort of uh, both uh, rehabilitate and empower veteran, veterans themselves in the wake of war, but also uh, reconstruct American society in the wake of war. Uh, and that, uh, uh, that the, um, the, the images we see here are part of um, not just the inclusion and participation of African Americans in the war effort, but also a testament to their, uh, their systematic and continuing um, exclusion from, uh, from, from those, uh, uh, those efforts and, uh, and from the, the sort of the social good and recognition associated with them. Um, so we've got the, the segregated barracks as just one uh, kind of vivid example of that. Um, and then just one other thing that I'll mention about it is the fact that uh, unlike the Claggett Wilson um, images, uh, these, these paintings um, by Pippin, uh, he made them uh, a couple of decades after the war. So uh, Claggett Wilson, I think, made, his, uh, uh, made most of those paintings in 1919, 1920. Um, and uh, these, are, these are paintings that, uh, um, uh, that were that were made much later as and so they're you know they're retrospective they're reflective um, but they were also a form of therapy uh, so as I understand that Pippin actually took up painting as a form of uh, physical therapy for his war injured arm he was injured by uh, uh, by gunfire and had um, impaired mobility in uh, uh, in his arm and he took up painting as a as a source of healing uh, 
for his body, but clearly it also served as uh, a kind of a valuable uh, medium for uh, retrospection and for processing um, complicated and, uh, and difficult memories. Um, but it, it, one of the things that also means is that uh, his injury is part of what constituted this art. It's part of what constituted our ability to see the war and his representation and recollection uh, of it. Um, and, uh, and, and also, as it turns out, as I understand it, it constituted him as, a, as an important artist in, um, in the, the late 1930s and, and early 40s when he kind of came to public prominence. And so one of the things we can think of there too is sort of the, the force of war as a, as a kind of, you know, at the same time as it is, literally at the same time as it is profoundly wounding and disabling, uh, it is also a culturally generative force. You know, things come out of it. It makes us think things. It makes us see things in new ways. Um, and it gives rise to new forms of expression. Uh, that, uh, that, and again, the, the, the kinds of aesthetic expression that we see here um, uh, both confront us with experiences that are very difficult to imagine, but also invite us to imagine those, uh, those experiences um, and invite us to imagine our relationship to them in some, some very powerful ways, I think. If you notice, I don't know if you can see them from where you're seated, but there are actually, there are black soldiers in the lower portion of this painting. You see the Germans are surrendering to them, but just as in life, in their true situation, the black soldiers actually disappear into the painting, which is, I think, kind of, um, kind of significant here. Um, I understand he did this painting 300 times before he finally accepted the, the last version. Um, and also, I think it's worth to pointing out the frame around it. He actually made this frame, too, as like a, a tableau uh, toward his therapy. Um, and I came across this great quote by this artist, and he says, I can never forget suffering, so I came home. I could never forget suffering, so I came home with all of it in my mind, and I paint from it today. Yes, uh, I think he also said that, that war brought art out of him. Yes. Yeah. So um, I'm afraid that is all of the time that we have. It is now one o'clock, um, and I, I do encourage you to go see the exhibition. Um, for example, the, the Horace Pippin uh, starting home, uh, it, it's almost a sculpture uh, um, as much as a painting because of the, the layers uh, of paint that the artist applied. Um, so I want to um, give my thanks to all of you and, and, of course, to Lisa and Ken for these incredible insights about the episode.